What is going on? Welcome back to Jiu-Jitsu Outlet. I'm sitting down with, once again, the uh, the sensei master, honestly, in my mind, because you've done it all, man. You've done the Olympics. You've done pro MMA. You've done uh, high-level jiu-jitsu tournaments. You've competed at ADCC. Dr. Roddy Ferguson, thank you so much for coming back on the show. I appreciate you. Hey, Paul, thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I've been doing this new series where I ask experts this important question about what are the principles of the martial arts? And I'd love to ask, hear your take on that. Like, what do you feel are these mysterious principles that we always hear about, but no one ever really defines? Well, I, I don't think there's any mysterious principles when it comes to, to martial arts. I think we got the, we have Sun Tzu's art of war that kind of directs us when it comes to the, the martial arts. Um, when it comes to judo in particular, we have um, what Sensei Kano or Kano Shian provided. Uh, we understand that those principles are mutual welfare and, and, uh, and, and, and mutual benefit. Um, we also understand that that judo has a way to it. Uh, it has it's, there's a gentle way. Uh, when it comes to the principles of jujitsu, I don't know what the principles of jujitsu are because jujitsu doesn't have a way to it. This is why you see it deviating so much from its original roots, which are judo in terms of Brazilian jiu-jitsu, because jiu-jitsu doesn't have a way to it. So what happens is people grasp and they grab what is uh, what's in vogue at the time, and that becomes their particular way. And you see the you see the the, the movement of, of gi and then the movement into no gi and then the movement into leg locks and then the movement into uh, a certain rule set and a movement into butt scooting and a movement into the anti stand up and then a movement into well th this is how this is more realistic than than this is but all those things they keep sublitating from the original root of judo because jujitsu in and, in and of itself does not have a way it's like people arguing about should I wear a gi or shouldn't I wear a gi well there's no military that we have and there's no martial art form that we have that doesn't have a gi to it, that they have a gi. When you look at Bruce Lee, when he started Kung Fu or Gung Fu, he had belts, he had a uniform. When he came up with his Jeet Kune Do concepts, there was no gi. But his Jeet Kune Do concepts are more of a esoteric conceptual framework not a hard line conceptual friend. They're more along the lines of these are Bruce Lee's thoughts. This is what Bruce Lee garnered from doing these specific arts, from, from dipping into boxing, from understanding karate, from understanding kung fu, from understanding um, uh, um, taekwondo. These are the things that Bruce Lee picked up, and these are his Jeet Kune Do concepts. This is his conceptual framework of how to do arts. Now, Jeet Kune Do in and of itself, that's our really first introduction to what we would call MMA or mixed martial arts based upon the conceptual framework of mixing the martial arts together to find out which is the best thing to do or what are the best, what's the best way to practice in order to apply uh, these particular arts into their real life principles. Because every, every martial art is good for what it's good for. That's that's what it's good for. Jeet Kune Do is kind of the the I would say the the preamble to the mixed martial arts movement. But when it comes to the the hard line principles of of what a martial art is about, man, a martial art is is based upon they're based upon war games, understanding the art of war and applying it in a fashion in which you can practice so that nobody gets hurt. I think that's a beautiful summary of it. And um, I wanted to dive a little bit deeper in on uh, jujitsu specifically. So when you're teaching jujitsu, or if you're putting together a jujitsu specific curriculum for your academy, what are the principles that you have in mind specifically for jujitsu that you feel are important? I have transcended the Brazilian jujitsu space. Um, I still get my rank in Brazilian jujitsu. Um, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is Judo. It's just, there's no if, ands, or buts about it. I'm a Rokudan in, in Judo. I'm a sixth degree um, black belt in Judo. I'm a fourth degree black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Um, I've read 
many books, um, there's there to to call Brazilian Jiu Jitsu Brazilian Jiu Jitsu at this particular time and space and place in terms of my educational background, it would be the incorrect thing to do. I don't care how much a sport evolves or an art evolved evolves the the art that we're all practicing is judo. Now we might we might compete in a sport called Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. We might compete in a sport called judo and those sporting rules change over a period of time. But the bottom line is we are doing judo and that's all you're doing. And when it comes to the principles of judo, I, I keep the principles of judo, meaning the gentle way. I understand that the foundation of it is to um, teach overall biomotor skills, overall human development, to, to create a better citizen and use judo to create better citizenship. Um, and that's what I do. I also use judo as an educational tool to help people develop resilience and to become tough. Uh, do I still, quote unquote, sell Brazilian Jiu Jitsu when people come into the school? Yeah, but when they get there, I tell them exactly what it is. I tell them, man, this is, we, we're doing judo. I mean, are we, we're really good at Newaza and we're really good at Tachiwaza. We're really good on the ground and we're really good on, on the stand up. And we're, we're about a good quality 60 40 split. 60% being the ground and 40% being stand up. And that's, that's just what we do. I'm, I don't feel comfortable knowing what I know now as a practitioner of the arts, proselytizing jujitsu when I know for a fact what it is. Like when I'm watching Helio Gracie compete against Kimura, I am watching a judo match, period. I'm watching Kimura put on a Udigarami, which they call a Kimura in, in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And it is, it is Udigarami. There are no moves that are in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu that aren't in Judo. There's no new, there's no new leg lock. There's no new neck crank. There's no new wrist lock. There's no, there's no new strike. There's no new Atimiwaza. All of the self-defense that, that they teach in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, all that stuff is in all of the Judo Katas. It, it to to sit there and at this particular time, space and place to turn the blind eye to it and to take off a gi and then say you're doing something different is almost asinine. It 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 shows a lack of education and a lack of, of growth. I think you're hitting on something very important here. And it's interesting because if you ask most Brazilian Jiu Jitsu schools about the history of the martial arts, especially the history of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, they'll start that history with the Gracie family in Brazil. And that just doesn't make any sense. I mean, it's, uh, so that's just not true. <laughs> like it, it was happening in Japan. It was happening in Brazil before the Gracies got involved. And I feel like there's almost a larger art here, if that makes sense, because Jigoro Kano even adapted judo from Japanese jiu-jitsu, right? I feel like that's where there might be some confusion. Like, what about that? What about, could you tell us a little bit more about that time when Jigoro Kano was first putting together judo? Well, the reason why judo was created was so that it could be played. That's why you play judo. It's because, I mean, I can't practice the atimiwaza or the eye gouging techniques or the ankle locks or the heel hooks or the neck cranks of judo full speed. And any time that I spar and I dumb the techniques down so that you can tap and then we can continue, we have now injected a level of gentleness inside of the play, which then becomes judo. It becomes the gentle way to do things so that we can continue to practice. When you're rolling in jujitsu, you're doing judo. Why? Because you're not trying to kill the other person. You're trying to roll in such a fashion that you allow the person to what? To tap so that you can continue to learn because it's a, it's a process of education. It's an educational process. That's exactly what it is. Now, there's a level of bastardization that occurs within Brazilian Jiu Jitsu based upon the lack of nomenclature that is in place, meaning calling things a hundred kilo position calling a choke, the Ezekiel choke, named after a guy that did judo who was choking out some Brazilian jiu-jitsu players. He was on the Brazilian, I believe, national team or judo team. A guy named Ezekiel was choking people and they started calling the Ezekiel choke. Yeah, but it's not the Ezekiel choke. It's so called Sode Garuma. 
when we go through this process of nomenclature bastardization, we actually stop the growth of the sport. You see Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in and of itself going through the same iterations and growth iterations as Judo did in its, in its early stages, when it really doesn't need to if it just combined with exactly what it is and just created its own Newaza World Championships, then, then it grows. In the United States market, we have people thinking that Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is bigger than Judo. It's, it's, it's asinine. It's, this past weekend, I was at the U.S. Open. There were 2,100 competitors at the U.S. Open. Bigger than most wrestling tournaments in the United States. Like, judo is, is bigger than wrestling in the world. Judo is a harder sport than wrestling in the world. Because, ah, judo's not, yeah, it's a harder sport. What makes it harder is that there's more people that practice it. What, make it, what makes it harder is judo is a martial art and a sport. Wrestling is a sport. Wrestling is made for the grind. Judo is made to mimic the kill, which is why you have the epon. I have a perfect throw, epon, match over. I get up by two or three points in wrestling. I can wrestle two and three periods and make my way back. Now, there's something to be said about the grind and coming back and, and wrestling your, your personal demons and wrestling the things in your life and wrestling to get yourself back after divorce and wrestling to get through uh, college and wrestling to get through grad school and learning those principles of wrestling. And then, it, and then there's the, the, the thing that you learn from judo of moving through throughout life, trying to always chase perfection, trying to always chase the poem, trying to always chase the the... Try, try to always, quote unquote, kill the thing to my best ability. The two things are different and one is harder than the other. The chasing of perfection is, is a lot more difficult than the other. And then we look at the data. The data is just the data. You know, it's, the data is the data. The judo is just a, it's a more difficult sport statistically based upon the amount of people that do it. I completely agree with you. Like, I think people don't understand. And people don't understand how big judo actually is. I remember reading a book called Falling Hard, where it's, it's this guy from the West who he travels all over the world training judo. And he writes about how surprised he was when he got to France. And he learned that judo is the number two sport behind soccer in France. That, uh, that judo, at least I think this book was written back in the 90s. But um, I mean, when, I, when you see a lot of other countries, especially in Europe and obviously in Japan and in different parts of Asia, judo is absolutely huge. And uh, people just over here in America, they don't they don't get that because they're like, oh, if it's not popular in America, it's not popular anywhere. Right. Like, no, that's that's not how, that's not how it works. <laughs> it's got to be the craziest thing. Like you would. Americans have such a nationalistic view um, of the world and, and a myopic view it, to the point that we have a. We have a game that nobody else plays, basically, American football. And it's, and, it's, and it's called American football. And we have a championship inside of our country. And then we call ourselves the world champions out of all the other countries in the world. Then we have a game that we change the rules to called basketball. That There, there are international rules in basketball. We have our own set of rules that we play by. We win a championship, then we call ourselves the world champions, and our team can't win the world championships. We have to yeah. send an all-star <laughs> team in order to win the championships, and we've gone to the Olympics, and we haven't won every time that we've gone. And and right. I, I think that this this mindset kind of spills over to the point where we just believe we're the best in everything. And I think, and I think it's a great thing because you, you want to believe that as a United States citizen, you want to believe that you're the best in, in everything, but you also want to prove that you're the best in everything. And I think that we've, we've got through this, we're going through this, this time of, um, uh, I forget the name of the Arthur, where we have the death of expertise, where nobody really believes in data anymore. We believe in populism. Um, we, we believe in memes and things that are posted on the internet. And we run with those things like they're the truth. And unless you've traveled and you understand the global community and the global sport community, you just you really don't realize how how big that 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 judo is. Yeah. And um, I, I really love the perspective you're sharing here that truly jujitsu is judo and the what we're practicing today in the modern world and calling it Brazilian jujitsu is almost just a bastardized version of judo in a lot of ways. Right. And I feel like. And I, 
And I don't mind it, but I'm not going to do it anymore. I mean, I, right. I think that everybody has to reach their own level of um, self-realization within the martial arts process. I think this happens to everybody when people come into, I don't care what martial, I don't care if you come into Aikido or Taekwondo or karate or judo. When you come in as a white belt, you, you're coming in and you're being indoctrinated through that particular sport. You, you understand that karate has its own take on the martial arts based upon the empty hand. Taekwondo has its own take about on using the feet. Judo has its own take by you know looking at the the, the grappling, the grips, and the takedowns. Jiu-Jitsu has its own take by looking at the, the ground. All of them have their own take. Boxing has its own take. Boxing is basically swordsmanship through the use of gloves. Um, and all the martial arts come off the sword. But if you study all the martial arts and you go to the highest level on them, you'll understand that Taekwondo also has grappling in it. Karate also has takedowns and arm bars and chokes. Judo also has striking. It's just most people never see the Atemi Waz inside the judo. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu also has all the takedowns and stuff that judo has. It, have, it, has, it has all of them. But if you, if you study all those arts and you get to the apex of all those arts, they're all going to meet at the same exact place. Right. All of them. It's just there's no way to do everything. So some people specialize. Yeah. You, what you're saying reminds me of something that my coach, Mike Morgan, told us a few months ago. He sat us down after class and he was talking about how, you know, he sees people in the gym using these different moves and we're working on new things and this, that, the other thing. And he was saying that um, he doesn't care about any of the new techniques or about anything that any of that kind of stuff. And he said, guys, he's like, I don't want you to think of this as Brazilian Jiu Jitsu class. I don't want you to think of this as Muay Thai class or whatever. He's like, this is how do you win the fight class? He's like, I'm going to teach you how to win a actual altercation in the street where you get on top of the person and you can control it. He's like, that's what I care about. I cared. Can you actually defend yourself when it counts with striking on the street, you know, or in inside of a cage, you know, inside of a real situation? He was like, man, I don't care about this De La Hiva game. I don't care about this uh, fancy stuff that's coming down the pipeline, like the X guard and this, that, the other thing. And um, for me, that really rung true. That really just felt like there was so much truth in that, that we need to go back to what you're talking about. We need to go back and say, what are the things that we really need to focus on here? What are the most efficient techniques across all the different disciplines? And what's going to actually provide the most safety to the practitioner? You know, what's going to actually give them a real sense of confidence? What do you feel like that is? Like when you're teaching your students, what are the te the techniques that you feel are most important to emphasize when it comes to just being able to defend yourself and handle yourself on the mats? Man, it's, it's only one. It's only one. Get top, stay top. That's it. Listen, the, 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 the problem that I have with the way that modern day submission wrestling is, is taught and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is taught is that, and don't get me wrong, the beauty of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is the guard, 100%, okay? Just like the beauty of, of, of Judo is the, is the throw. That doesn't mean that that's the, 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 the thrust of the art, but it's the beauty of the art. Um, there's, no, there's no military science book. There, there's no um, war class. There's no, there's not one page in Sun Tzu's Art of War where the advice is, you know what? We're gonna run down in this valley and then we're gonna kick their ass on top of the hill. That's not how it works. When the art of war lets us know that the best ground is the high ground. So when you're in an art and the art in and of itself is a martial art, okay? It's a martial art. Martial means warlike. It's a warlike art you to practice a warlike art and what you do and the way that you practice is the antithesis it is the direct antithesis it is in diametrical opposition to the 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 way that a war game should be played to the point where you jump into the valley instead of taking the high ground it is no longer to me a valid art form anymore 
as a martial art. It becomes a pure sport. I don't have a problem with teaching sport. I teach sport judo too, and sport judo is a sport. All right. I I do I do understand the the art. I took the time to learn the art of judo as well, concurrently and more importantly after I retired. But I learned the sport form of judo. A lot of people have learned the sport form of Brazilian jiu-jitsu and think that they have learned self-defense or learned how to defend themselves or learned a martial art. They've learned a martial sport. The best advice, understand how to get the takedown, understand how to get top, understand how to stay top. And if you're on the bottom, understand how to get to the top. Even when you look at MMA, which is, I don't know if MMA is the closest thing that we have to a real fight because it has its, it has its own set of rules too. Um, we, we could argue that fencing is the closest thing to a real fight. We can make that argument. Um, but when you're on the bottom in MMA, what's the thing that you want to do in the bottom of MMA? What do you want to do? Get to the top. Get out. <laughs> we get to the top. Get to the top. Stand up or get to the top. There's no, there's no triangle. There's no arm bar from the bottom. There's no. Your job is to get up, get out, or get top. That's it. That's your job. Yeah. I, I, I think, I think somewhere along the lines, we're, we're missing the. And I, I don't mind the gamesmanship. I don't mind the. I think there's um. In, in education. There's a not only a school of thought, but there's an understanding that there's educative value in play. I believe that there's educative value in play. I believe that changing the rules of the game and allowing people to adopt to different rule sets is good for the body, it's good for the mind. However, we should not deviate from the principles of the martial arts. I Meaning, one one of the direct violations is to slap five and then just sit on your butt. There's you cannot you. There's not one combat sport, Paul, that you can give me. Not one, where you're allowed to sit down or go to your butt without any negative penalty happening. Or there's not one. Boxing, fencing, Muay Thai, Karash, Kali, Aikido, Judo, wrestling. Kickboxing, like, like what, there's not, there's not Senegalese rap, like, uh, sumo. Like there's, there's no, there's no. Yeah, it's not scored. It's scored as you, uh, you, you did no. something wrong. Like, <laughs> there's no. Like, it, it, this is the only art form where you can sit down. And it's and it's looked like, like man, it's, it's got to be the craziest thing. It, and the other thing is, if you're walking, okay, and and you lose control of your bladder and you pee on yourself a little bit, you, you lost control of your bladder. Right. You, you can't you can't you can't put the yeah. urine back in the urethra. I mean, it came out. <laughs> if I foot sweep you and you fall to the ground, bam, and you stand back up, you still lost control over yourself. I don't care how fast you got up. You still lost control yeah. over yourself. You can't say, oh, he didn't control him. I did control you because you didn't jump on the ground yeah, by yourself. <laughs> right. So so these these particular the way they indoctrinate the public was he didn't have any control. He didn't control. You were on your feet. Now you're not. Now you're back. You lost control of yourself. You peed on yourself. Just a little bit. But did you but you still peed? Yeah, you're right. People forget about the concrete. I, 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 I don't, I don't, I don't understand. Excuse me, sir. I said people forget about the concrete. They forget that in a real life situation, there would be concrete, and uh, it wouldn't be a soft fall on the bat. <laughs> It'd be over. Yeah, this is different, man. It's different. Like um, you were talking earlier about how MMA, you know, isn't the closest thing that we have. I totally agree. There's this new thing. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's called King of the Streets. And it's brutal, but it's on the concrete. They wear shoes. Um, there's no, uh, there's no rules. So you got the the soccer oh, kick. I think they even allow groin strikes. 
Um, it's not for the faint of heart, even watching it. Like I couldn't watch very much of it just because it's freaking brutal, you know, and um, it's different. It's very different that uh, <laughs> I mean, well, you've seen a street fight. It's basically a high level street fight, you know, and uh, there's a lot of brawlers who go in there. But I mean, just go watch 10 minutes of that and you'll see real quick that uh, it's different than what's happening in MMA uh, and definitely quite different than what you see at a jujitsu tournament. And uh, if sure. you're a jujitsu guy, you think that you know self defense. I encourage you go watch ten minutes of King of the Streets and think think about how you do inside that that cage. Because <laughs> I'm no, I'm not getting in that cage willingly. <laughs> like man, that is a tough cage to get in. <laughs> I'm super good at hand fighting and grip fighting. Um, yeah, I'm older now, so I'm a little bit slower, but I'm decent at it. I remember about ten years ago, I was messing around with this guy who was an expert knife fighter, expert knife fighter. I don't think anybody has, I did not pretty many people have messed with an expert knife fighter before, but I, I had the knife and he was like, cut me full speed, full speed, man. Couldn't cut him. I got disarmed every time. It was to the point where I just threw the knife away because I had a better chance. I mean, I, my chances of beating him increased significantly without the knife. Because in reality, it was our knife. I was just holding it. This is what I found out. I didn't realize that it was our knife. I thought it was my knife. And he showed me very quickly that it's our knife. You're just holding it. Um, there was nothing that I can do. But, but I don't think that people, people don't understand that there's people who are trained in that space a lot better than you. And you're thinking that because you know how to roll around on the floor that, that you can't get stabbed. You can. You're thinking that because you can roll around on the floor, you can't get knocked out. You go to a gym where people who have been boxing since the age of six and they're, and they're 18, 19 years old, and you think that you're just going to close and take that person down before they hit you with an uppercut and shut your lights out. You got another thing coming. Yeah. Like, yeah, but you got another thing coming. Yeah. It's, it's true. It's just, it's just very different, man. It's very, very different. That's Very something good. I've wanted to get into more Very is uh, I want to learn the different weapon styles because I realize that's a glaring hole in my martial arts career is uh, the knife defenses and the weapons defenses or even just the stick fighting, you know, all that kind of stuff. Because I was thinking about it, you know, uh, if the, the, um, yeah, yeah, the Kali, the Arnis, like we, we don't know that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like that's that's where I want to expand as I get a little more down the pipeline. But I'll have to find a good a good teacher, you know, because there there isn't really there's not a whole lot of those guys, honestly, especially not here in America, the super legit ones. But it's on my bucket list to to find one <laughs> and get some of that training, you know. As I've gotten older, so you have there's there's two things that happen when you when you get older, you you make a decision to extend further into the process or retract um, into the martial arts process where I'm pulling myself back where I don't, I don't, I don't let's say need to access all of the, the art form anymore. I want, I want the basics. And because I'm getting older, I'm thinking, okay, longevity of life now. Now the martial art for me is based upon discipline. Um, making sure I, I hit on my doctor's appointments, my dentist appointments every year, making sure that my supplementation is right, you know, forcing myself to stretch, which, which I don't like, forcing myself to still go to the gym to maintain my mobility, um, to maintain my flexibility, to maintain my, my condition and to maintain my strength. Because those things, without those things, I can't do the art anymore. I can't do any of it anymore. When I was younger, I was still on the, on the, the technical acquisition phase. I mean, how much can I, how much can I go? How much more can I get? How much more can I get? And I'm not on that phase. I'm, I'm on a phase, but how much, how much now can I keep? So it's just, it's just different. That, that's where I am now. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. I feel like as you get older, I've, I've heard that it's almost like you become a white belt again and you are, you're, you're almost like relearning the whole process of, can you talk a little bit more about that? Like, what was that like for you kind of going through that? So the first person that introduced me to that was Dustin Dennis. They call him clean, Dustin, Dustin clean Dennis. When I got my black belt, um, I got my black belt in 2006. 
And he took me all the way back to like the, I mean, the beginning phases of, of jujitsu. And what I found out was, I was like, damn, all of this shit works if you spend time doing it. It's just that you go, you go through the curriculum so fast and you're trying to get to the next nice, shiny and bright thing that you never take the time to really perfect the thing. Like, man, the, the basic, the basic, um, Kata Juji Jime, which we call the cross choke, but there's three cross choke. There's Nami Juji Jime, Kata Juji Jime, and Gyaku Juji Jime. Um, the basic Kata Juji Jime, one palm up, one palm down, that basic choke works. It's just that we haven't practiced enough setups to get there to make it work. Man, once you learn how to set the choke up, change hands, break the posture down, have your arm over the person's down, bring your knees in. You can hit that choke damn near every time. Once you learn it from the mount, you can damn near hit it every... Once you know, once you understand how to maintain the mount and keep position, you can hit the choke every time. You don't even have to move to another technique at all. I, I didn't realize that until I got older. Until I got older, I was like, Man, I don't need 50 million things. I just need to practice this one thing right and get it. And once I got it, I'm good. Man, that makes that makes a lot of sense. If you think about it, it makes a heck of a lot of sense. Like you just got to get that 10,000 reps in. I think about in the Book of Five Rings, Miyamoto Masashi says a thousand days to learn a technique, a thousand days of training to learn a technique, 10,000 days of training to polish it. And I think about that a lot because he, we always hear reps. We always hear 10,000 reps. But he says, no, 10,000 days of training. So who knows how many reps you hit every single one of those days of training. But also he said, he never says perfect. Yes. He says to polish it. 10,000 days of training to yes. polish the technique <laughs> just to get good mm -hmm. at it. <laughs> Basically is what he said. 1,000 just to learn how to do it. <laughs> I, I try to think about that all the time. 100%. So I wanted to talk about one more thing. Um, I feel like um, there's something that we talked about earlier that I'd like to just dive a little bit deeper on, just this whole sort of idea of the principles of judo. And I know that you talked about that um, in judo, the principles are very set. They're handed down like they were, they're handed down by Jigoro Kano and by the ancients, basically. They're handed down by our ancestors, what these principles are. Could you talk just a little bit about those for someone who isn't familiar? Because we have a lot of people who train kind of the more modern day Brazilian jiu-jitsu here watching the show, and they might just not be familiar with that at all. Could you share some of those principles of judo that you feel are the most important for people to understand if they've never yeah. heard of this before? The main one, man, is, is mutual welfare and mutual benefit. Um, I think that that gets lost as we get, you know, as we as we get more in the competition space. Um, we don't we don't realize that our our training partners are not our enemies. They're just our training partners. And the person that we compete against, is, they're not our enemies either. They're just an opportunity to put a, a mirror in front of ourselves so that we can improve. And I think that's the part that we miss. I think we miss the, I think when we walk into the dojo and, and we, we devalue the, the etiquette of, of having a clean gi, of, of having a gi that's not mixed, mismatched colors, uh, of bowing onto the mat, of, of bowing to the sensei, of asking for the permission to train. I think when we do all that and we just jump in and then we just, you know, slap five and fist bump without bowing, I think that that lack of etiquette and that lack of discipline, it, it chips away at the art in, a, in and of itself. It's no, it, it's no longer a martial art. Martial arts, and then this is outside of judo, but martial arts have a, 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 a um, they got rank and file to them. I Meaning there's, there's a reason why there's somebody who has a certain rank above somebody else who has a certain rank. When you go into a no-gi dojo, how do you know who the black belt is? How do you know who the white belt is? How do you know who the, like, I, I remember I was in a no-gi place and I was um and I was rolling with some dude and I was like, don't sit back for leg locks. I said, learn how to pass the guard first. I said, and then when you exhaust 
trying to pass, I said, then start opening up your leg lock game. But going for leg locks without exhausting how to pass, you're never going to learn how to pass. So I said, stop going for leg locks. He said, why? I said, because I said so. That's why. And he caught an attitude, but there was no way for him to know who I was because there was no, there's no gi. There's no, everything is, everything is based upon how bad you are. You know, there's, there's a, I can't, I can't beat any, I can't beat a blue belt IBJJF world champion right now. I can't, can't beat it. Too old, too slow. Just, I mean, just not good enough, you know, just too old. My body's banged up, but that level of, of respect, of respecting the man, and you you ask a good question that I that I think is, I think that it is a reflection of where we are as a society more than the art itself, and I, I think that the art itself or the martial arts should they should help to reframe or restructure society for the practitioners that are within it. I don't think we're doing a good job of that um, as a sidebar. I, I just think the, the respecting right. of the elders, the respecting of the, the person who was higher ranked, um, making the, the person, the, when we're doing throws or we're doing techniques, the, the highest ranked person goes first. If both people have the same rank, it's the person who got ranked first. If both people have the same rank and they got ranked on the same day, it's the older person that goes first. But the people in my dojo, they, they know this, you know what I mean? Um, it's we, we've lost that inside of the inside of the dojo. We, we, we just don't have that anymore. You know, everybody just coming in and, you know, it's like a, a family reunion. You slap five and then you run around the mat and then you go. And I, I just think those particular not even judo principles, though, but those principles of a, a, a of how a dojo is run. Those things are lost. I can tell you somebody who does a great job at this in, in, in the realm of jujitsu. Salo Ribeiro. Yeah, Salo definitely. Ribeiro's school is traditional. It's damn near run like a judo dojo, to be honest. With you. It's a it's on it's run like a it's run like a judo dojo, man. Yes, right. I mean superb. I mean, when I watch what he's doing online and the and the white geese inside of the dojo, and I said, man, this this guy this guy gets it, man. This guy gets it. And John G. Ribeiro, John G. and Salo have studied enough. That Johnji Johnji has said we are all judoka. He he's he's transcended the he's transcended the Brazilian jiu-jitsu space and he studied enough to know this is what I am and this is what I come from and this is who I am. Jacare same right. thing. Jacare was a Jacare was a regular black belt now, without the without the red patch on it. That's interesting. <laughs> It's so true, man, though, They're like all these different martial arts, they all go back to the same roots. And I think I really like what you said, that we stop the growth if we kind of restart it, because then it's almost like a business that you're constantly restarting and renaming. At the end of the day, you're never going to have yeah. that brand. Never, like if you started up a new judo school every single week or every every year you had a new name for your judo school, it would confuse the local community. They would be like, oh, I thought right. Tampa judo was his right. thing. But you know, what if you renamed it every six months? It wouldn't really make any sense. So I feel like that that was a really good point. That's something I hadn't I hadn't thought of that before. You know that that we're kind of stifling it. We think of it like, oh, we're growing it, but we got to get back to the roots a little, maybe. I think we got to get back to it. It's like if I came up with Ferguson's Jacket Wrestling, you know, and I said I'm the founder of Jacket Wrestling, you know what I mean? It's like it's can't do it. Can't do it. We're just you know it's. It's, it's, it's judo. Sambo is also. Well, Robert Drysdale came on the show to talk about his new book uh, about the history of the Brazilian jiu-jitsu lifestyle and how Carlson Gracie played such a huge part that doesn't really get attributed as much. And um, I really love his perspective. And he taught he told me about reading a, a different book called uh, Shoke, which I which I purchased on his recommendation. And he we talked a lot about that on the episode I did with him. But um, in that book, Shoke, he the, the author goes through and he talks about the history of jujitsu in Brazil. 
And he talks about how there was a lot of jujitsu that was happening and a lot of grappling that was happening in Brazil before the Gracies ever got involved. You know, we're talking about the end of the 1800s or the early 1900s, that there was an established jujitsu community in Brazil. People were watching jujitsu matches and judo matches, and they had they had something that so sounds kind of like a smaller version of the UFC, where people would gather and they'd have MMA, they'd have ballet tudo fights. You know, they'd have, which were, is, ballet tudo is just another word for MMA, basically. They would have uh, ballet tudo fights. They would have judo matches. They would have jujitsu matches where it was, uh, they also would have catch wrestling, which obviously is very similar. You know, so they would have all of this stuff for a very long time before the Gracies ever popped on the scenes. And then the Gracies came in with Gracie jiu-jitsu. And it's this new thing, you know, and uh, really it's it's not not at all. It's just an older version. And man, I went one last thing I'll say on this. I went to a seminar with oh, Dean Lister once. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Before you go, here's what I want to say. What the hell did Helio learn? He learned judo. He learned judo. From <laughs> yeah. He learned judo. What? Listen, uh, so, and what did he teach? He taught judo. He taught judo. Yeah, he taught, he judo. taught judo. When you watch his kids, when you watch his kid, when you watch the old film of his kids practicing, you watch him teaching, he's teaching judo. Yeah, judo. That's it. That's it, yeah. man. It's crazy. He's teaching judo. And I mean, 100%. I don't, I don't, uh, I think I understand why they did it. I think that they needed to, they wanted to make it more popular. I think that they did it with good intent. Oh, I, I, but I, um, I don't know. I feel like we need to get back. We need to have a history lesson. I think everyone in jiu-jitsu needs a history lesson, to be honest with you. <laughs> and uh, I hope that's what we can deliver on this show, man. 100%. Last question for you. I really would like to get your take on this. Um, Dean Lister, I went to a seminar with Dean Lister once, and uh, Dean was talking about this topic, that it's at the end of the day, we don't really know where this all came from. And he said that he went on a trip once to to Syria and he was visiting an old museum in Syria. And he said that there is a 5,000 year old statue of someone doing an omoplata. <laughs> and he's, he's put up his hand and he swore to God. He's like, I've seen this statue 5,000 years old of someone doing an omoplata. Um, what do you feel like is the origin of all of this stuff? Where do you think, I mean, you're very well read on this. Where do you think a lot of these arts come from? Do they come from India, like Greece? There's all sorts of different, like, what do you think happened here? How did this all come to be? They all come out of Africa. And there's a study about the wrestling in ancient Nubia that you can find on Google Scholar. But they all come out of Africa, all of them. Um, the... The, the art forms that we see are even talked about in the Bible. When you when you hear the story, whether you believe it's fact or fiction or whatever you believe it is, it, it speaks about how Jacob wrestled the angel. And when Jacob was wrestling the angel, Jacob was winning. And then the angel popped his hip out of socket, which my, they're doing submissions. So he pops his hip out of socket so that he can win. And, and Jacob says, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. But... There's submission wrestling going on even in the Bible. Um, this, this, and I tell people they had on clothes, so they were doing judo. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but this this goes back to ancient times. This this goes back to ancient times. You can look at what what um what Dean is talking about. You can look at the the hieroglyphics on, on the wall back in uh, in ancient Africa. They're they're wrestling. They are they're doing submissions. They they there, there literally is nothing new under the sun. As much as I, I love Keenan Cornelius, um, and I, and I love what he's done with the Worm Guard and the lapel, is that we're on the planet for four thousand weeks. You have to be delusional if you believe that in your four thousand weeks while you're here that you're the only one who's ever done that particular thing ever. Like you're talking, but we're talking about the, we're talking about the, the, the history of, of, of mankind and you're only here for 4,000 weeks. You, you're like a, you're like a, a speck of sand in the, in the, in the population of people who have, who have, who have littered the earth. 
and you believe that in your short period of time that you've created one technique uh, and you you were able to lace the, the gi a certain way. And, and Keenan doesn't say that he invented it, but people think that these people have invented techniques and they name these things after people and they've been around for a while. Like the De La Hiva Guard has been... A, people think De La Hiva invented the De La Hiva Guard. You can go look into, in a book called My Study of Judo by Koizumi. He has ankle locks, heel hooks, knee bars. Yeah. De La Hiva. Like everything is in the book. All these things, you know, these things, they get named based upon being attributed to a certain art that focuses on a certain thing. Like I told you before, Taekwondo focuses on a certain thing, on the, on the kicks. Boxing focuses on the, the upper body pugilism. Um, Greco-Roman wrestling focuses on the upper body wrestling. Freestyle, upper and lower. Um, with no chokes. Sambo, leg locks, throws, no chokes. Judo, on the sports side, chokes, armbar. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, chokes, armbars, takedowns, leg locks. And then everything has its own focal point. Um, Senegalese wrestling has its chidoaba, you got karash. Everything has its own focal point. But they everything comes out of Africa. All of it. I feel like Civilization itself seems to have come out of Africa. The more that I study history, hundred <laughs> percent, yeah, or, or at least Africa and the Middle East. Like if you look at Gobekli Tepe, this is getting into a completely different conversation. But if you look at a site like Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, the it's getting older the more they dig. You know, they think it's twelve thousand years old, which is insane. Hundred percent, it's insane. Hundred <laughs> percent. Well, Dr. Ferguson, I know you've been very generous with your time. I know we got to wrap this up, but is there anything else that you want to talk about related to this topic of kind of the principles of fighting, the principles of the martial arts, and especially judo and jiu-jitsu? Man, I would recommend that everybody read Musashi. Everybody read Sun Tzu's Art of War. Of course, Book of Fire Ring, Sun Tzu's Art of War. Um, the book Choke that you mentioned. I think people should also uh, read uh, My Study of Judo by Koizumi. Um, read the the ancient works of, of Jigoro Kano. If you're a jiu-jitsu person and you're not reading the works of 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 Kano sensei, I think you're really I think you're really hurting yourself. You gotta you gotta read the, the works of, of Jigoro Kano. And then understand how his mindset changed changed over time and why he wanted to put judo in the Olympics. It may not have been the the greatest for the the art form, but it was great for the for the propagation of the sport. Um, the beautiful thing about judo and why it does not change and why jujitsu does change is because judo has a kata that it follows. So it doesn't matter how the sport of judo changes, we still have a set form of kata, a set number of throws, a set number that everybody knows so that the no matter how much the sport changes, the art doesn't change. Hmm. This is why you have the, the Gracies trying to preserve jujitsu through through self-defense, because self-defense for them is the kata version of jujitsu. But the problem is, is that sport people like myself, same as in judo, we don't want to do kata unless we're forced to do it. People in jujitsu turn the blind eye to kata, I mean, to, to the self-defense because they don't necessarily want to do it. So the more that they move toward the sport, the more they'll move further away from their base unless everybody goes back to exactly where they came from, which is judo. Do you think it'll ever happen? Do you think that it's possible for all jujitsu people to kind of come to this realization that you've had and transcend? 100%. Man. 100%. I believe it too. You've, you've uh, given me a lot to think about today. I really appreciate this, this conversation. Oh, man, you're welcome, man. I appreciate the time. Thank you for allowing me to share. Of course. And where can people find you if they want to follow up with what you're doing? Oh, man, you can find me on, on Instagram, uh, at Rodney Ferguson or at Tampa Florida Judo. You can also find me uh, on Facebook, Tampa Florida Judo. Um, I would encourage everybody to go grab. Uh, I have some free products, man, at www.nawazaexcellence.com and also www.gripfighting.com. Well, 100% free.
I'll put all the links down below in the show notes. So go check it out if you're listening. And uh, Dr. Ferguson, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really yeah, appreciate thank it. Thank you. I appreciate it, man. Take care. Have a great day. You too.